Lynn, the president of the Berkeley City Club. And I want to um, thank, first of all, all our City Club members who are signing in for their continued support of the club. For any of you who are in the Bay Area, I'd like to encourage you to eat at Julia's. Uh, Julia's will open for indoor dining on October 27th. The city of Berkeley is allowing us on October 26th, but it's a Monday, so we open on the 27th. And I'd like to encourage people, whether you're a club member or not, to take advantage of our hotel special offerings. We're offering promotions for your out-of-town visitors who may be coming for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Um, please check uh, our website or get in touch with us. Um, as you know, if you're a club member, we're offering uh, curbside pickup uh, and terrace dining already. So I encourage you to eat at Julia's with those. We have yoga, both virtual and in person, and we have now Pilates starting, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> starting next week, both virtually and in person. We're also offering to club members the opportunity to reserve a room that you may want to work at. Uh, you can be the only person in one of the club rooms for, the, uh, for several hours. Um, get in touch with the club about that if you're interested. And I want to encourage you to plan events uh, of up to 20 or 25 people at any of our outdoor or indoor um, venues. Uh, venues. So with that, I'm going to turn the uh, program over to Sandy, my wife, who's in charge of the arts and culture program half in charge of the arts and culture program. So thank you again for your patience. We had a few kinks to work out. And uh, Madison August is our staff person who also um, shows a lot of grace under pressure and has helped us work out the slideshow. So one of the advantages of moving our arts and culture program to Zoom was that we could recruit speakers from almost anywhere in the world, actually. Um, but lucky for us, we did not have to go far afield to find an expert on Wayne Tebow one of America's most beloved and most recognizable artists. Not only has our speaker Margareta Lovell studied, lectured, and written about him, but also she knows him. And our timing, as you can actually see in the slide that's on your screen, um, our timing could not have been better. Um, Tebow turns 100 almost exactly a month from today, and he's being widely celebrated as a national treasure. Professor Lovell is an award-winning teacher and author. Her interests and research vary from fine arts to forests, from folklore to food. She has degrees from Smith, the University of Delaware, and a doctorate in American Studies from Yale, where she began her academic career. She also spent two years at Oxford, where she studied drawing, painting, calligraphy, and paleography, paleography and um, her resume has sent me to the dictionary more than once. Paleography is the study of ancient writing systems and the deciphering and dating of historical manuscripts. Now you know. She is the J.D. McAvoy Professor of History of Art here at the University of California. And the UC website describes her as a cultural historian working at the intersection of art, whoops, sorry, I just lost my talk, of art, history, anthropology, and museology. I'm not sure if I'm saying that one right, but that's the science or practice of organizing, arranging, and managing museums. She told me that the common thread in her work was American cultural history and it's a miracle, immaterial expression. Just to give you an idea of what that expression covers, here's a sample of some of the titles of her articles and books. Food, Photography, Anxiety, and Desire. Dashing for America, Frederick Remington, National Myths and Art Historical Narratives. A Material World, Cultural, Society, and the Life of Things in Early Anglo-American. America, that was a book she co-edited and a book she wrote on her own, is A Visitable Past, Views of Venice by American Artists, 1860 to 1915. When I asked, Professor Lovell, what was hanging on her own walls, she stated emphatically that she was not an art collector. Like many of ours, her refrigerator, she said, is covered with family photos. Nor does she paint. Between her teaching and research and volunteer work, she says she has no time for hobbies, or as she put it beautifully, my life has no empty corners. That's especially true these days because three of Professor Lovell's young grandchildren are living with her because their mother, Professor Lovell's daughter 
is a COVID frontline ER doctor at Kaiser. So we are especially honored that Professor Lovell has made time to join us tonight to talk about Wayne Tebow's California. Yes, you can. It's too dark. Okay. It's a great pleasure to be back sort of um, at the City Club. Um, it's also a pleasure to speak to you about Wayne Tebow, one of the most generous of humans, as well as one of the best artists uh, of our period. Um, he is celebrating his 100th birthday um, by, among other things, continuing to play tennis every day uh, and paint uh, every day still. Could I have the next slide, please? Tebow's national and international reputation was established with food paintings such as this, depicting bakery cakes and treats. He was associated with the pop art movement um, and these works with their bright colors, their common everyday, very American food subjects, their sly geometry and wry humor have been well known and much sought after since the early 1960s. What I'd like to call your attention to is the way his medium oil paint um, way his, his medium oil paint manipulated with a swirling flat brush or paint spatula imitates the medium of cake icing um, that it represents. These juicy impasto or relief passages underline the handmade character of his work and allow us to empathetically feel the gestures of the artist's hand and ask us to brood about the character of representational imitation. The rhyming of two very different artistic medium, media um, in this work, paint and pastry, and the attention that rhyming draws to the crafting of paintings is also a feature of Thibaut's less well-known landscape paintings that I'd like to draw your attention to today. Could I have the next, please? Thibaut experimented with landscape painting early on, even in the 1960s, when his audience was clamoring for food images, he painted a few landscapes, such as Orange Grove and Hillside. Here, his shimmering blue shadows, vibrant edges, and dramatic color juxtapositions move outdoors, and he tackles deep space and complex geometry and geological forms and agricultural plantings. The diagonal slope of the steep hillside of the painting on the right will become an important and unsettling feature of his later landscapes. It was painted quickly, he told me, in four or five hours in response to a beautiful sunlit moment. Tebow speaks of his paintings as being both records of observation um, and um, self-contained, self-explanatory works organized around the logics of art as much as the logics of vision. For instance, could I have the next, please? Ali, let me in. Notice that the lines of Thibault's well-pruned orange trees do not converge in his painting as they would if we observed an actual orchard. Uh, that's a California orchard um, on the right. Um, and as, as they do in, in uh, uh, the vision we're, we're used to, either photographic or, or with, with our, our own optics. But rather, his trees splay out and gesture toward the distant mountains to keep the space of the painting open. The painting, in other words, reproduces recognizable objects and places, but it declines to use pictorial perspectives and to mimic reality. Thibault creates paintings that work on their own terms. Could I have the next, please? In more recent decades, his landscapes have become more numerous and they coalesce around three subjects or three categories of subject. The San Francisco streetscapes as we see in Ripley Ridge on the left, images of the Sacramento River Valley and the Delta particularly that we see in Waterland in the middle, and mountains, especially the Sierra Nevada mountains as you see in Cloud and Ridge on the right. In each he's produced vivid and thought-provoking 
uh, images, and, in e and each of these represents a um, quite a few dozens uh, of images of human altered space and human habitation yeah. in these three important California ecologies. Yeah. Urban San Francisco streetscapes, rural Sacramento River Delta farmland, and the Sierra Nevada mountains. Now landscape painting has been an important genre in Western art since the 17th century and has flourished as a way for artists to describe and their audiences to understand the relations between humans and the natural world, or between nations and their homelands. Landscapes tend to be politically charged. Landscape paintings describe elements familiar to us from the ambient world. They look as though they're about nature, but they're usually about human-made space, human activities, alliances, ideologies, and psychological states. Could I have the next, please? First, a word about California, familiar to us all. As you know, it's a populous state bordering the Pacific Ocean along its whole length. Its three main zones are the temperate hilly coastal region that we enjoy and that is known as a Mediterranean climate. The huge Central Valley and the ridge of high mountains, the Sierras, along the eastern edge. Could I have the next, please? Most of our fellow Californians, 38 million of us, live in the urban San Francisco Bay or the uh, Los Angeles area in the south. If it were a country California had before the economic chaos of COVID-19, the ninth largest economy in the world, right behind Italy and ahead of Russia. The state capital, Sacramento, is a seaport city located inland on the Sacramento River. Sacramento was the main provisioning site for 49ers en route to the gold fields in the Sierra foothills in the east during the gold rush. It's a seaport, but it's in the Central Valley, a vast, flat, fecund agricultural area that's the source of the majority of the fruits and vegetables that feed the nation. Some of us mostly see it uh, in the transect on our way to Yosemite uh, or to Tahoe. Sacramento is not a town that's known for artistic achievement. Kibo lives in Sacramento. It's 3,000 miles from New York City where the vast majority of American artists cluster and hopefully clamor for attention. Could I have the next, please? Yet Sacramento is where Thibault lives and California is what he paints. The medium itself, oil or acrylic on canvas, stretched on wood supports, affixed to a wall, centered about five feet off the floor, tells us we must attend to its message as we might to poetry. And it tells us that that looking may be rewarded. This rewarding is structured with many tales that Americans tell themselves and others about themselves and their relationship to the hospitable continent that they've occupied so completely. These images do not flicker or speak or flash or move, they hang still and draw the viewer toward them, telling stories of a precarious conquest of dramatic landscapes. Could I have the next, please? San Francisco occupies a peninsula, the Pacific Ocean on the west, the Golden Gate to the north, and San Francisco Bay to the east. To the northeast is the Sacramento River Delta, gateway to the gold fields and the agricultural riches of the interior. To the southeast, that imaginary zone, the Silicon Valley, clusters around Stanford University and the city of San Jose. Berkeley is directly across the bay from the Golden Gate. The most startling aspect of San Francisco to visitors to this city is its terrain 
Or to be more specific, what is startling is the way the city was plotted with a system of neatly rectangular blocks, despite the mountainous terrain on which most of the city is built, as you can see in the 1870 map on the right. Could I have the next, please? A grid overlaid on a mountainscape results in a web of very steep streets. These photos will give you a sense of the steep grade of many of these streets that you have no doubt negotiated. I myself remember in the pit of my stomach renting a car in San Francisco on my first visit to California and not quite believing what I was driving on. In the 19th century, these streets, having been laid out on a grid, were too steep for horses to pull loads um, or uh, to, yeah, so, so the, they, they meant that a good deal of the city was inaccessible, hence the creation um, of these cable cars that were devised to carry not only passengers, but goods, of course. Where these ordinary conveyances of the 19th century, the horse-drawn omnibuses or cabs, were impossible. It really was heart stopping to drive out of the rental car place and to face one of these downslopes in an unknown car with uncertain brakes. Um, it reminded me of those black diamond slopes that I sometimes gotten on um, skiing um, without um, what? With, <laughs> with, with, a, um, uh, with only a measure of wanting to be there. Could I have the next, please? Thibault's subject in San Francisco is these characteristically steep streetscapes. This is Ripley Ridge of 1977. In this work, which, I which I'm selecting to represent many, he uses bright candy colors, including primaries, blue, yellow, and red, familiar from his celebratory food images, to describe the dramatic and yet quotidian intersection where four roads converge. The street markings, the street, street markings are unconventional, but make clear that automobiles are expected to be here uh, on this grade. The street that occupies the center of the image and therefore the viewer's attention is punctuated by vivid blue shadows of the buildings on the uphill side. These buildings have, in the language of the painting, projected their own representations. We see their facades, their volumes, their heights, and the profiles of their cornices, not in the usual vertical plane, but in silhouettes that have cast on the horizontal surface of the deserted street. The facades are described in exquisite detail. Each has been painstakingly described, but each remains illegible to the viewer. The largest of the blue shadows we take to be that of an invisible tall structure that closes the street out of sight on the right. Its dominance of the foreground, its size and its divorce from its structure are unsettling. Our own point of view is precarious. We can imagine ourselves having climbed with effort up steep sidewalks and steeper stairs, standing in a protruding window of a very tall, also invisible building. The almost blank sides of the two structures that flank the opposite uh, corner ascend and descend in abrupt diagonals, <laughs> indicating the steepness of the street that crosses our view. Sophie, yeah. quiet, please. <laughs> Above the large structure on the left, a cheerful cubist array of yellow, white, buff rectangles describe the tops of a row of ordinary everyday buildings ascending the steep shadowed street in front of us. After a few moments scanning the bright geometry of these many structures, it becomes clear that we're looking at a man-made environment imposed on a very inhospitable natural space. Two thin ribbons of houses cling precariously to an inhospitable natural space. A flattish ridge between an unbuildably steep hillside rising on the right and a dark cliff-like precipice that descends resolutely and threateningly to the left. The subject of this city scrape is gravity. Some might say it represents heroic achievement, 
humans transcending the constraints of the natural environment. Others would say it's a poignant comment on the hubris and the irrationality of plotting a grid on a mountainscape. What makes the painting festive and positive is the bright sunlight with which the scene is bathed. What makes it unsettling and psychologically uncomfortable, even forbidding, is the dark descent of the cliff behind the lives lived in ordinary, tidy, middle-class structures arrayed so neatly and orthogonally, seemingly unconscious of the terrain and the punishing, inescapable effects of the force of gravity on mere humans. Could I have the next, please? This painting, like most of Thibaut's San Francisco paintings, comments on the power of the idea of the grid as the seemingly ideal, rational urban settlement pattern for both rural and urban settlement. The diagrammatic visual residue of the Enlightenment, the ideology of equality, clarity, and democracy embodied in the grid has been active and well in the United States since the 18th century. And yet the grid is sometimes irrational, as when it triumphs geographic logic, triumphs over geographic logic. Thibault's San Francisco images point to the power of gravity to chasten us and remind us of the array of superhuman natural forces that literally underlie our buildings and our assumptions. Could I have the next, please? Inland from San Francisco lie a series of bays and the delta where the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers spill the freshwater runoff from the Sierra snowpack into the tidal salt bay. Can I have the next, please? In the delta, 738,000 acres of rich farmland, much of it below sea level, are protected by a thousand miles of earth levees and laced by dredged channels in a maze of little islands. Can I have the next, please? The Sacramento River Delta is then an entirely man-made landscape overlaying a natural landscape. Row crops and grain crops are raised here, for the most part on small holdings. Could I have the next, please? If San Francisco is dizzyingly vertical, the delta is pancake flat. The delta is a maze of small islands and meandering channels. Narrow roads run along the top of the levees, which offer only a small amount of vertical relief. In the 1990s, Thibault took this landscape as his subject. He moved to the delta and lived there at Sorry, the time. He produced dozens of jewel-colored works describing the waterways and productive fields of this unusual part of California, rarely seen um, by tourists. Please be quiet, Sophie. Sophie, please be quiet. Could I have the next, please? Waterlands is exemplary of this chapter of Thibault's life and work. The raking light of early morning provides shadow and the water provides reflections, doubling the vertical elements of this very flat landscape. Thick impasto or relief brush strokes describe ripples on the water and plow lines on the land. As we noted earlier, the rules of the perspective are not invoked to describe space. And the horizon line, which traditionally in landscape painting bisects the image, is here pressed to the very top, compressing and flattening the picture space. Waterlands is about work, the dredging of the slough that constantly takes place to keep these waterways navigable, the constructing and repairing of the levees that we can imply from what we see and the planning, plowing, and planting of each field, vividly evoked in paint strokes, mimicking the action of the tractor. The fields are a patchwork of color and crops. Some like the orchard in the lower left are organized with industrial regularity. Other fields exhibit parallel plow lines, 
but they bend to accommodate the irregular boundaries of the fields and the meandering path of the river. The landscape is spare and quiet, but robust in its rich display of red, yellow, and blue hedging the white expanse of water. A grove of trees inhabits a small peninsula of land unsuitable for cultivation, a bit of wildness and randomness in a landscape otherwise the focus of human labor and care. Could I have the next please? Channel Farms, another painting of the Delta series, vibrates with a vivid yellow and its opposite a purpley blue. In the distance, a tractor plows a straight furrow across the largest field. We can imagine the tractor in its harrow making its way with geometrically regular sweeps back and forth across the entire golden expanse. The traverse is recorded with parallel brush strokes, the medium of paint describing parallel furrows of the soil. In the foreground, the water shimmers and reflects. Along the narrow watercourse that transects the bottom of the image, a pair of dark levees mark its edges punctuated by trees and shrubs. The levee system is the Achilles heel of this orderly pastoral system. Constructed over a century ago, these earthen dikes keep the river at bay and keep the fields that are vulnerably below sea level safe. But age, earthquakes, and the forces of spring freshets threaten breaches, floods, catastrophic for the crops and economy of this region. This is an agricultural landscape of jewel-like beauty, a landscape in balance. But the forces of erosion, floodwaters, and shifting tectonic plates dwarf the human efforts described so brightly, scratching the surface of the plowed islands. Can I have the next, please? The third California ecology Thibault has painted, and the one he has made the focus of his efforts in the 21st century, are the mountains, specifically the Sierra Nevada mountains that run down the eastern border of California like a formidable spine. For pioneers trekking across the continent from St. Louis in wagons, this was the last great and often deadly obstacle to achieving their goal. For gold seekers, the rugged Sierra foothills spurred their dreams of easy riches. These are formidable mountains up to 14,500 feet to their, in height. Their peaks are forbidding places and the passes are high and inhospitable. Could I have the next, please? This mountain range also offers magnificent wonders familiar to you all. Lake Tahoe, huge high lake surrounded by snow-capped peaks, and Yosemite Valley, a narrow glacier-carved valley flanked by mile-high, almost vertical granite walls. Among the best-known features of Yosemite is Half Dome, a magisterial rock sliced in half by a voracious glacier, and here recorded by Ansel Adams in an image familiar, I'm sure, to you all. Could I have the next, please? Some of Thibault's mountain paintings are whimsical, such as this, which captures just the top of Half Dome, with a huge cumulus cloud like a cartoonist's speech balloon hovering over it. Could I have the next, please? One could almost see this Thibaut painting as a parody of the tone of high seriousness, even sacredness, with which other artists and photographers such as Ansel Adams have approached this subject. Adams was renowned for waiting patiently for hours for the rising moon to complete his photographic subjects. Thibaut here appears to upstage the little moon with a cloud mass worthy of the celebrated cliff. One of the things this comparison makes clear is that Thibaut generally does not root his mountains in the landscape. They seem to float without base, context, or resolution. Can I have the next, please? His mountains are monoliths, their scale suggested by the tiny trees that cling to their surfaces here catching the last rays of the sun. Almost all his mountain paintings have raw cuts, as we see here as though a glacier 
or the dynamite of a road crew has just sheared off their faces, revealing dark, almost molten interiors. If we approach such an image with a sense of physical empathy, we grow quickly timid at the sight of that catastrophic gash and fearful imagining ourselves clinging to normalcy of life among those trees on that thin crust of hospitable earth, resting on that very inhospitable mountain dark vertical rock. Hear that note of disquiet, of anxiety about the power of gravity that we saw in the San Francisco images becomes the major theme of the painting. Next, please. Big Rock Mountain suggests the puniness of human endeavors above or below this sheared off mountain of molten blue. There is a Wagnerian quality to these images. These works picture the tenuousness of human affairs, the thinness of the Earth's crust, and suggest the scale of the forces that we ignore in daily life. Next, please. These are imaginary places or composite places, but they do evoke real places. Tibo's Laguna Rise, for instance, on the left, reminds us of Acoma, a native Pueblo uh, city in New Mexico that's the longest continually occupied urban area in what is now the United States. Its situation on a high mesa was defensive and apparently effective before the Spanish conquest. Could I have the next please? While vibrant color and luscious brushwork seduce our eyes, there is nevertheless a sense of vertigo in Thibaut's San Francisco images and an undertone of threat in the water-soaked dikes of the Delta images. But those forbidding notes grow loud in the mountain scenes where the habitation of humans clings to precipitous edges of gigantic rocks and road cuts that suggest not so much mastery of the natural world as the meagerness of human efforts. Taken together, these paintings speak of an America in which titanic forces such as gravity threateningly underlie and potentially undermine everyday life. The Earth's crust is a thin, precious zone where humans labor to make the land habitable and productive. Tivo's landscapes describe a fragile world, beautiful and exuberant, but fundamentally beyond human control. His landscape suggests the dignity of labor in the face of titanic extra-human forces and counsel an attitude of both stewardship and humility. His works are as much about paint as a medium as they are about the golden state, the value of looking, the covert danger within the quotidian, and the value of art as a medium through which to comment on human occupation of an extraordinary and beloved part of our planet. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Two things that I neglected to say, and that is, um, okay, I, uh, now we can see each other again. Um, we, I neglected to say two things that if you'll notice, Professor Lovell is um, sitting in the courtyard of the Berkeley City Club, which is strangely still sunlit, <laughs> despite the dark outside our windows. Um, and that she showed, like Madison, some extraordinary grace under pressure in some last minute unable to share screen issues and not to mention the sound effects of her grandchildren in the background, <laughs> which um, was a pleasant backdrop. Anyway, I'm hoping that some of you have some questions that you'll send me through the chat function. And we have, as long as we have her attention, does anyone have any questions? Let's see. Um, I'm waiting. Come here, Pepper. Come All right, we'll wait another minute. Um, I mean, why is it that we don't see these landscape paintings more often? Why none of us think of these when, <laughs> when we think of Wayne Thiebaud? I think it's part of my crusade to say that I think we should. Um, he, he, is, he is best known for the food paintings. Um, and I have enjoyed looking at those um, and writing about those. But these landscape paintings I find incredibly stirring. Um, I fell in love with the Delta paintings and have expanded from there. 
Okay, we have a few questions coming in. Um, someone would like to know what the dimensions of some of these works are that ah. you were discussing. Ah. Um, the very largest ones are, uh, and they're the mountain uh, images. Those are the largest ones. Um, they are, as I would say, some of them are as, as high as six feet, six feet in, in height. Um, but generally speaking, his, his um, uh, paintings are of a relatively smallish uh, size. Okay, another question we have. I, I, you, you said this already that he's still painting at age 100. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Um, Where's the studio? Thank you. Could, you. could you watch the puppy, please? <laughs> oh, we have a puppy too. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, can I elaborate on that? I just think it's amazing. And in fact, when I've gone to talk to him, I feel almost badly that I'm pulling him away from his easel. Uh, that, that when he sits down and talks to me for two hours, that he could be producing fabulous art that, that I am obstructing somehow. The interesting thing, turn, turn it down, sweetie, please. The interesting thing uh, about um, Thibaut is that he keeps a lot of his works. Uh, there are some of these uh, paintings circulating, and, and they are um, in important collections at the Crocker and the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco uh, locally, for instance, but um, he has kept a lot in the family. He has kept a lot uh, in an archive that has recently been established so that scholars can come um, and see every single sketchbook that he's ever worked in. Um, uh, it's, he says he never goes anywhere without a, a sketchbook. Um, and um, He's a very orderly person and he's kept all of, all of his, he's his own historian, uh, which is absolutely marvelous. Um, so we're gonna have some really good scholarship and you will begin to know more and more about this artist. So someone is asking how long do these pictures take him to paint? I don't know if you can generalize. Well, I, I can because uh, the, the very fastest is four or five hours for that beautiful little hillside that, that he painted early on and now is in the collection of his stepson. Um, uh, but some of his paintings, he goes back and works on them years later. In some cases, we'll have, you know, ordinarily that we give the, the year of a painting and when we publish it. And in some cases, uh, a painting will have something like 1986 to um, 1993. <laughs> and, and that doesn't mean that he's been working on it every day during that time. It means that at some point he went back and, and either scraped down or painted over uh, or rethought, completely rethought whole sections. Um, so, so, um, uh, so it's hard to answer that question, but he is a very uh, careful, painstaking painter. He was a teacher of painting for many, many years at UC Davis. Uh, he headlined their department of, of uh, pract art, the practice of art. Um, and was a great teacher. So some of the, is, is there any estimate of how many paintings he's done? Someone would like to know. Wow, I've never asked him that. And, and I'm not sure he would be able to answer um, in a hundred years, how many paintings can you do? It's, uh, uh, and has he done, actually done an inventory? I have, I have found records of some paintings and shown him um, you know, bad photographs that were taken at the time in, in let's say, the late 50s. Uh, and he says, hmm, yeah, I had forgotten all about that one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm not going to hazard a guess. Yeah, someone else is asking, and you sort of talked about it a little bit, but why have the landscapes been under-exhibited compared to the other work? Well, he was first discovered, if that's the right term, uh, as, a, as a painter of food subjects. Uh, and, and that was wildly successful. His very first exhibition was sold out almost like the second day of the show. Um, and, and those works have sold extremely well uh, ever since. So, so that's what people associate with his name. Um, but he is ever uh, creative. He's always thinking of um, new painterly problems. 
He's never satisfied with what he's done. And he certainly doesn't repeat himself. Um, he's always sort of pushing himself to do something more interesting, more thought provoking, more difficult than the last thing he did. Uh, okay, uh, we have another question. How did you first get interested in his work and how did you meet him? How'd... Ah, um, well, I, there was a, um, an exhibition at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, I think, I think or early 90s. Um, and I knew of his work. I, I had actually taught his, his work within the context of the history of American art. Um, but then I, but in that exhibition, I ran into some paintings that really just stopped me cold. I just, um, I, I just, yeah, um, they were just so stunning and so interesting. And so unlike the ones that were always published that I thought this is, this is intriguing. Um, I found out that he was um, still alive here in California. And although I don't usually work on artists who are still alive, most of my work has been uh, on, on painters who died in the 18th or 19th century um, uh, or early 20th century, I decided that I was really so intrigued that I really, really wanted to, to do some work on, on, his, on his painting. So I approached him and I said, would he sit down and talk to me? And he said, sure, no problem. Uh, he's incredibly generous. Um, and um, and I'm, I was, um, you know, bec because he'd spent so many years as a teacher, he was very happy to talk. Some artists, I think, don't do a lot of teaching, um, are not so happy about talking. They'd rather just do the art and, you know, be quiet. Uh, but he's happy to talk. And, and um, so I've spent a couple of um, very happy days uh, in his studio. Um, and uh, introduced him to a graduate student that I've been working with and, and she's working on a dissertation on his work and, and he's been very generous with her uh, yes. and giving her plenty of time and access. So it's, yeah, it wouldn't have worked with everybody, I promise you, um, but, but he's, he, he, yeah, I was intrigued and he was uh, cooperative. So do you happen to remember which were the paintings that stopped you in your tracks? Oh, the Delta paintings. I, I mean, I knew the Delta a little bit. I had um, done a little boating around on the Delta, uh, but, but most, even, even people who've grown up around here don't know the Delta very well. Um, and it, it struck me that he really captured that part of the world and, and made it um, in, intriguing in a way that most people don't understand it to be exciting or interesting. Um, um, so someone else is asking, uh, what's the highest price one of his paintings has sold for? Well, I'm not, uh, that's not the kind of thing that I do research on, but um, um, they, they do. Ow. <laughs> I think the puppy just bit the child. Um, <laughs> or the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> or the other way around. Um, um, uh, They're well into this. Yeah, I don't. Let's just say a, a million dollars is, is by no means uh, unusual. Yeah, so. and um, is there an upcoming retrospective somewhere? Uh, yes, there is an, an exhibition that is actually opening, opened this last Sunday at the Crocker. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's called something like A Hundred for a Hundred or something. Anyways, a hundred works that uh, he helped the curators select uh, to to um, memorialize his career and his life. Obviously, not all of us can go flock up there to see it. Um, we can, um, I, I don't know whether they're doing um, appointments or, you know, I'm not sure how they're doing it, but there, there, there is a show on right now at the Crocker. So speaking of the Crocker, is he being wined and dined by museums all over the country? As, in California? <laughs> What's going to happen to all his work now? Ah, well, as I say, he's put a lot of it into this. Um, let me see if I can introduce you to this character. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, everyone wants, I mean, every curator wants 
a really wonderful Tivo in their collection, you can be sure. Um, and he's been generous about um, making that possible. But he wants to concentrate those things in Sacramento. He's very, um, good night, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> One cuteness after another here. <laughs> good night, sweetie. I have gas in the morning. Um, good. Um, I've completely lost my train of thought. We're talking about whether museums are vying to get uh, a collection or to yes. establish a Wayne Tebow museum or... Yeah, um, well, yes, they are. Um, uh, the, the SHREM uh, at Davis uh, uh, has made a, a big play that direction and the Crocker too. Um, but I think he's, he's keeping most things in the foundation uh, which he has established um, um, and with the archive. Uh, is, that, is that a physical space? It is a physical space. Um, and it's not open to the public, but it is open to scholars. He's not, he's not interested in being a really rich guy. I mean, I, I guess he, he could sell a lot more than he does. Um, hey, 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 puppy, come back here. Come back here. Come back here. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, he, yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't he, he's not a... Uh, I won't say he's not a businessman. Um, I should say the great sadness in his life is that his son Paul, who was a businessman and was working as his um, dealer, died of a brain uh, um, cancer. And I think that's where those mountain paintings come from. Uh, he, he mentioned to me, because they start as soon as Paul died. Paul was, was the, as it were, the business partner in the relationship. Um, and he mentioned to me once that uh, Paul had a house in Tahoe, up, up at Tahoe, and he would go up into the mountains to, to visit Paul. So, um, okay, we have one, one last question, and I sort of know the answer, but you could give a much better one. Someone's asking about Deep and Corn influences. They were I don't, know which, I don't know which way they went, but they were, they were good friends. Um, um, uh, it's, how do I do this quickly? Um, and they were they were painting in, in ways that were alike for a while. And then Diebenkorn was criticized for for simulating reality too closely, and he went much more abstract. Come on, puppy. Uh, and and so he he changed his manner of working completely. But Thibaut did not. Uh, he still stuck with a recognizable landscape. Um, but they they were good friends, and and he always speaks well of of um, of Deep and Corn and their relationship. Okay, we seem to have one last one more last question from from a person who knows a lot about art. Um, was Arthur Dove an influence? Oh, interesting question. Um, Tebow talks about museums as being our um, bureau of standards. Uh, he goes to museums all the time, and he says he learns something every time he goes. So I think it would be very easy to pick the work of almost any artist and say, oh, I can see where you may have seen something like this uh, that became fertile for your own work. Um, so I, I, I haven't talked to him particularly about, about Dove. <laughs> you really have to see the space. <laughs> He doesn't understand. He, he thinks I should be taking him for a walk. Um, he doesn't know anything about Arthur Dove. <laughs> All right, well, it looks like you have a few other demands on your time, and we so appreciate what you've shared with us tonight. And I should also mention that um, Professor Lovell did not hesitate to let us move her talk up a month when our scheduled speaker for October had a death in the family. So not only does she show grace under pressure, but she's ready to roll on a minute's notice <laughs> and to juggle all these balls in the air. And we, we both admire this Renaissance woman and are very honored that you were with us tonight. So well, I, I really, really like the, the, the City Club. Um, I love the building. I found the, the, the institution very hospitable. So I was glad to do it. Uh, um, and I hope that the club prospers in spite of what's going on now. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, take care. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye -bye.